Well, I'm joined today with uh, Paul Smith of the New Market Soccer Club. Uh, Paul is the technical director for uh, the club in New Market uh, and has been there for the last eight years. Paul, is that correct? Yeah, approximately. Yeah. So I started there as a, as a summer student in uh, 2010. Um, I came over, my third year university was a placement year, so I came over, ended up going back to England to finalize my degree and then moved back here in 2012, late 2012. So i back at the club for eight years. I've been in this, in this role as TD, but this will be coming up to my third year now. I kind of, I started a summer student to kind of work my way up, so. Great. And what yeah. other kind of coaching experience besides uh, the Canadian experience you mentioned being from England, what kind of things did you uh, yeah. get involved with back in it, back home? So my degree was actually sport development and coaching sciences. So it was very heavily linked into the coaching and being being from England, obviously football's um, a big part of my life. So I was uh, really mainly in, in football. I worked for Reading uh, when I was back there. So I worked in their community programs, um, after school clubs, but I also worked in their development programs. So I worked with, they have below their academy, they have um, development programs where they work with kind of their local communities and work with clubs like that. So we can try and recognize players within that to then get them in the academy. Um, and also worked on the women's side uh, in the women's game and worked for their, their first team uh, on the women's side as well. So most of my, pretty much all my coaching has really been with soccer. So and yep. really only in Canada as well. Uh, that's great. Well, well thanks for, for taking the time to have a chat today. So, I mean, obviously we're in unprecedented times with, uh, you know, uh, COVID and a, and a global pandemic. And I guess uh, part of the reason for us chatting today is from your, you know, position as a technical director and how, um, you have kind of your guidance and, and influence with the coaches in your club. Just really wanted to, to get uh, some of your experiences and best practices that uh, you've observed or even maybe used yourself in the last, uh, I guess, two months now since kind of the uh, the return to play started. So I guess, you know, what, what when going into this, what was the biggest and kind of most important consideration that you guys had as a planning team uh, for planning the return to play? Um. So to be honest, most of it and it is, hasn't necessarily changed on that front, really, because the health and safety of the players is obviously number one. Um, and that's always in like making sure the environment is in a position where the players feel safe and they feel that they can kind of do what they want to do. But that, the health and safety side was obviously key. We want to make sure everybody's in a good place where they feel safe, they feel comfortable and able to become a joining. So to be honest, obviously, we're in a kind of different situation where rather than being at school, we have um, with being at clubs, parents, we, give, we basically gave parents and ch the children the opportunity if they didn't want to play again, we completely understood. So the health and safety was fine. If they didn't feel comfortable, they didn't have to come back. And we gave yeah. that. We won't force anybody to come back and do that. Um, so the health and safety were really the main kind of key consideration, making sure whatever we did, um, we obviously followed the guidelines from Canada Soccer Gave on Terra Soccer, and then they get passed down onto us. So we had to have within our field, we had um, entry and exit points. So everybody had to come into onto the field of certain situations. When you get there, you had to sign in. So obviously we keep our contact tracing log. Everybody had to sanitize their hands. Um, players brought their own equipment all the time. Um, and then when the session was done, obviously then they would leave, um, leave to a designated entry point as well. And at that time, their hands would be sanitized again. Um, and then they kind of go on their way. But the health and safety was obviously the most important, making sure that everything we did was was as safe as it could be, and so there was no um, no issues on on that end. How was that communicated? Like, how were you able to get that message of all these different protocols out to the players and parents? Uh, a couple of different ways. So we through the club, obviously, we we can mass email everybody. Um, so all the parents were given that information. We also put together um, powerpoints that we presented to our coaches. Um, so our coaches, we have with our coaches, assistant coaches, and the managers, which kind of help manage the team. Um, and then they would individually then contact all their players as well. So they basically the parents would get the information twice. So they would get it from us as a club on a broad scale. We would then download download the information to the coaches and then they would also present it on to the, the parents and the players as well. Now, how did that, you know, you've communicated it. Do you have the protocols? Everything is planned as, you know, as best you can, not having gone through this before. To walk me through that first session, like if the players arrive, the coaches are there, they're excited, they're a little nervous. Like, what does that first session look like, and and and, and how does it work in terms of, you know, taking those plans and putting them into action? Um, so, uh, to be honest, a lot of everyone was really excited actually to kind of get back going. There was not obviously the nervousness at the same time, but everyone was very excited to kind of get back going. Um, we'd always we'd obviously make sure our coaches make sure they're there early. We actually had staff on 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 for every field as well. So the coaches were there, but we as staff made sure that everybody was signed in themselves. So we, we hired and made sure we, we were there 
to manage all that situation. So if anybody had any questions or if anybody forgot to do a symptom check, because we also forgot to mention, oh, we actually did, everybody had to do a, a, a symptom check. Prior. Screening, yeah. Yeah, all that. So we made sure whenever we became, we obviously have our list of players. So everybody would come through that, um, check in and, and we'd go from there. And also from a coaching standpoint, um, we've given our coaches some guidelines on what to kind of go through on how, how to run the sessions and what to do. Obviously with being in phase one for soccer was completely socially distanced. We had, everybody had to stay apart from each other. So we've given kind of guidelines on kind of how to manage that. But everything seemed to go really well and we really didn't have any issues. And, and since then, we also, we also manage our parents in that sense where we, they parents weren't allowed on the field. So it was literally only coaches and players that were on the field at the same time. So there was, there was lots to obviously figure out, but it really, everything ran very smoothly. And we were very kind of pleased with the way everything went. So the content of the sessions that were planned, I mean, did that come from you and say, hey, here's a shell of kind of what we're looking for uh, for the first okay, couple of weeks or week and, and yeah. to kind of give the coaches a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of ease kind of getting back into it? Yeah, for sure. So we, we gave them a guideline. Um, we're very flexible with the, what our coaches do. So we have a we have an outline of what we want them to do and we gave them examples of how they should run it. Um, we we kind of gave them that freedom and that flexibility to say kind of within this framework you have to work within this um and that was a that was a challenge to be honest because going back to social distance practice is now getting like you have to try and stay realistic to the game and for us in soccer is there's so much decision making happening and within social distancing you you think about going straight back into kind of lines and people just passing back and forth and basic technical work but there's also a lot of other stuff that can be done and that was the biggest challenge for us and, and me as a technical director to be honest as to how we can make sure our coaches stay creative and keep the game at the forefront and make sure it's realistic all the time within the practice so decisions are being made no matter what yes there's a technical aspect to it and you can do that individually on your own um kind of for 10 15 minutes just to kind of get the kids back into it but then making sure all the practices aren't just past here past there like so we've got road what's happening so it's that was the biggest challenge to be honest is getting the creative juice is flowing and figuring out how we can actually develop sessions so that decisions can be made all the time. And what were some of the elements that you would attribute, like, you know, how were you able to get that, uh, the decision-making and the creativity built into the sessions rather than just kind of saying, you're going to pass here and move here and do those things. So we, an example, would you say? So a, a good example to us is what we, that's what's called a rondo in soccer. So it's basically a basic keep ball possession game. Um, so normally it would be, you could have, it can be a variety. It can be 3v1, 4v2, kind of depending on your numbers and what you want to kind of get out of it. But essentially you would base, instead of having the defender to free to roam everywhere, we'd set certain, we'd set basically a box in the middle so that the defender couldn't come right. out of. Or if yeah. we did it with two, there'd be two boxes side by side. So then yeah. there was the opportunity to kind of still split players in between from a passing standpoint that way. Um, it gets the movement happening on the outside rather than just kind of pass here, pass there, pass there. Yeah. So it kind of, trying to get those in different ways to kind of build all that stuff in was, was challenging, but it, it was very, very good to do. And the kids kind of helped that as well and, and made it enjoyable for themselves. Now, did you see the coaches kind of, you know, after a week or so um, start to take kind of some of you, I mean, you give them that framework, things go smoothly, as you say, because uh, people are excited. Did you see the coaches kind of own into to, to starting to be creative on their own right and, and kind of come up with solutions for some of the problems that, uh, you know, the structure kind of set out for them? 100%, yeah. And that's, and that's the, the, the beauty of being kind of in the role we've got. We've, we kind of want to set a framework, but then it's up to the coaches. If That's why I, I feel personally that, we can give you a framework and kind of say, this is, we want you to work kind of on this, 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 uh, whatever it is on the that's kind of tactical framework or whatever it is week to week. But I, if I give you a session plan, it's not your, it's not your session anymore, essentially. So I think it's very important that we give the coaches that freedom and that flexibility to kind of design that. Um, and it's, it was great to see, to be honest, the, the different things that everyone comes up with. And obviously then it allows me to take ideas from other people as well and kind of implement it when I run my session. So it was great to see. Now, what were you, would you say for you personally running your own session? So what age group uh, do, do you have right currently? So because I, I, I oversee all the programs, I kind yeah. of bounce between every group. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of ages where we're not, um, where we, we kind of lost the head coach just based on other factors and it is what it is. Um, so I, with the U9 girls, our under 9 girls program and under 11 girls program. So that's kind of where I've been more in, yep. in tune with them. But I, again, I kind of bounce around and try and get to as many clubs and many teams as I could. 
So what's been the biggest challenge for you personally? Like, you know, I know you've helped the coaches, but in terms of your own planning, like what are the, what are the things that you think that have been the most, most difficult for you to kind of implement or get, get going inside of training? I think, I think, as I mentioned earlier, it was really the making sure there's no matter what happens, there's decisions being made, um, especially the younger ones, because the, the little, little ones, like the under nines, all they want to do is play games. So when you come back and like you've got some possession stuff happening, that was the biggest challenge and um, making sure they just keep moving. Because like you said, you can kind of get back into old ways in, in essence, where it's literally just you kind of pass back and forth, work on base at technique work, but there's so many different ways and avenues to kind of work on that base at technique work where there's so many different ways to kick a football. <clears throat> there's not one way to do it. So why would we necessarily say what's wrong with, we obviously, we don't encourage this, but in a way, a toe punt, is not really the best way to actually kick the ball. But if it makes it from A to B, what's wrong with it? Yeah. So that was for them. It's then trying to work out really the best way to make sure everybody's moving because the under nine girls, we have like 20 girls in that group. So it's making sure we got everybody moving the whole time and nobody standing still while maintaining the social distancing. Because obviously at that age group, it was difficult for them at times where you constantly have to remind them, hey girls, make sure we keep our socially distanced and all that stuff. So. That was that was the biggest challenge, but again, just making just kind of come up with ideas to basically help them make decisions by themselves and not so yeah. us as the coaches giving them scenarios to kind of figure out how they can actually make those decisions. So walk me through uh, the organization of the session itself in terms of like how you're building in things like your warm up and then water breaks and and you know you just you, you talk about coaching uh, under nine girls and kids you know. They want to socialize. So how are you managing all of those things in just terms of like the, the basic organization of the session of yeah. activity to rest to water breaks? And, and, and you mentioned the, uh, the entry and exit to practice kind of walk us through, you know, what did that look like for you and what are some of the things that you, you know, took away from the experience as it went on, so to speak? Obviously, but like we mentioned, so everybody comes in, they have to sanitize, they have to sign and do all that process. We would set out um, a cone for every player, which would kind of manage their social distancing sidelines. And we'd actually give them the opportunity to kind of socialize there for us for a couple of minutes. So obviously while everyone's coming, everyone would maintain there. So it kind of gives them that social aspect. We then get into a kind of a basic warm up for those age groups. We like to play like fun little tag games. Um, obviously it's a little bit more difficult when <laughs> we've got to maintain the social distance. So there is the different ways to kind of do it. So instead of um, tagging somebody, you would have to, you maybe have to tag, t touch their ball. So try and kick their ball away. Um, so a little exercise of that and obviously from that standpoint and going back into we the way we like to originally set up our sessions to be honest is what's called the gag methodology so we do game activity game so you have your warm-up then you go into a, a modified game you come back and break into your activity then go on and go back into games so that's generally how we try and set up our sessions obviously it became a little bit um a little bit disjointed because we weren't able to play formal formal games um but we then Really kind of just after our warm up phase, we give them a little break. They obviously go back to their social, their, their area, have a little drink. Again, they can kind of have a little chit chat there um, while they're doing that and then come back into kind of their next game format, which would generally be some sort of possession game if we can. Again, it'd be kind of into groups of kind of three or four. We'd also set up little races potentially for those guys so they can say social distance, but it works on, especially for the younger ones. So they have the physical aspect to it. So they all, um, the physical issues so they're working on their agility balance and all that stuff. Um, then we kind of come back into more of a soccer related game. And then again, try and finish with some sort of shooting activity as well, especially when with the social distance, it was, it was tougher to manage, but um, we were, we were in smaller groups. So it's, there was, obviously less rest, um, less rest than if there was more players there, there yeah. was a bit more rest time there, but it was kind of, it was, it's hard to kind of really explain because it was kind of a little bit disjointed at first, but you kind of get into the flow and I kind of work through it. But like I said, we always try to work on making sure there's always decisions being made within all the practices. So it wasn't necessarily game activity game, but whatever, whatever the sessions were, it were, there was decisions being made all the time. You mentioned the physical in there and, how much consideration was given to the fact that you guys have started in uh, early July? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, kind of middle, yeah, early July, yeah. Yeah. How much consideration was given in terms of that physical aspect that kids potentially could have been sitting around for three, four months? Like, was there an element of like ramping up the intensity and kind of starting small? Like, what kind of, what kind of things did you guys talk about as coaches to, to consider those things? Our sessions, to be honest, we started off at 45 minute sessions as well. 
So we didn't go straight into an hour and back into an hour and a half. We kind yeah. of gradually built up. So we had, and we, and it was just, this was part, it wasn't necessarily our fault, but we actually ended up starting at one session a week. Just to start with, our, we are from our town standpoint, we were only allowed to have 10 players on an 11 v 11 field at one time, including coaches. Yep. So from eight all the way up to 18, you could only have 10 players. So 45 minutes kind of works as a great little starting point. It kind of, then we were able to build into twice a week at that at 45 minutes. And then gradually we kind of built into an hour 15 and now we're back in an hour and a half sessions after uh, we've been in back in our and a half sessions for nearly three weeks so okay now what kind of like feedback loop did you use i mean you're you're trying to build this you're trying to to build in for the players kind of getting their feet wet and getting back to you know normal activity and and, and what kind of what kind of things did you do to to, to pull the players or, or get the or pull the coaches a group of coaches in your in role role as the td to, to get a sense of you know how successful this was this was at, at a current stage so it's just constant dialogue to be honest it was so what we have regular coaches meetings so over zoom at this point we've been doing regular coaches meetings as i mentioned i try and drop in and see as many teams as i can so i'd always just go and speak to the coaches and speak to the players and see how everything's going are they enjoying it is there anything we need to change and adjust um kind of go from there and to be honest the kids and, and all the and the coaches to be honest have been so happy just to get back out on the field the first couple of weeks even though it was socially distanced practices, we had no issues whatsoever. Everyone was very pumped and pleased to be back. The kids were just overjoyed from, I think it's more just from a social aspect. Yeah. Really the, the kick in the soccer ball was just the second part of it. Then now they're able to see their friends again rather than being stuck in that. So that social aspect is huge. Yeah. Uh, and they were just really, really, really pleased to be kind of be back into it. So. How did the parents, uh, you know, that that's always a big part of the equation, especially with club sport. Um, yeah. And same with us in our in our scenario too. But how did the parents first deal with kind of not having that same interaction level that they're kind of accustomed to? And then what kind of feedback did you get from the parents in terms of you know you're taking their kids back in terms of getting them back in some normal yeah. routines? It was very mixed. Um, like I said, so some some chose just not to come back at all because they didn't feel comfortable. Um, but the ones that did come back, they were very receptive. They were very pleased in the way in the approach that we took to it. They that they saw the precautions that we put in place, and they kind of and we really try to emphasize like we're not going to do anything unless we feel it's safe to do so. And if you don't feel it's safe to do so, then please let us know. And if there's anything we can we can do to change it, like we can do that. Um, so again, it's, and it's just constant dialogue. So what I would re I would reach out to the, the parents. I would obviously if I'm going to see the, um, certain teams on the field, I would speak to the parents at the same time as well and kind of try and get their feedback that way. Um, but it was for us, it was just constant communication. It's if you don't communicate, people are going to kind of get annoyed. So we, it's just important to, to constantly do that and, yeah. and get the feedback coming on that way. So. Now, as you've kind of progressed into into stage two and and, and things have uh, somehow returned or somewhat returned to normal, like how would you start to build? Now you've, you've you know had physically distance training session for a month or however long it was, and you start to build in a little bit more of kind of the normality. But how did you build competition into what you're doing, knowing that you're not going to be able to compete against other clubs locally? Like how are you able to kind of fill that need for the players uh, on, a, on a weekly basis? So we started off um, just being able to go into some small sided games just to let them kind of play for a couple of weeks, just to, or really more of a week, just kind of let them play between themselves. Um, and then there's different, there's, we actually, there's a couple of different little formats. Um, so we set up some mini little inter, inter squad tournaments or like kind of, so they would each be split into certain teams and they can kind of get the competition going that way. Because once we were back into phase two from a soccer standpoint, we're obviously, we were allowed to play small sided games up to um, a certain age, so up to a certain kind of format, I mean. Um, so we would kind of set up that way. We've now, <clears throat> excuse me, we're now able to be into, into squad games, and sorry, into club. So we're now setting up exhibition games from team to team. So the 11 boys might play the 12 boys and kind of so we can build that competition in that way. Even before that though, in, even in phase one, when we were in stage one, we can, there was still an element of competition with, the, with everything. So when we do the rondos or the activities, you can still build in points, you can still build in those progressions that way. So the competition is still always there and that's why we try and feel that with the decision making, there's always a defender there. There's always somebody there, so you have to make a decision so you can make games out of those yeah. uh, those situations there. So that's what we try to kind of do with it. And one of our coaches has a great um, great game called the Davis Cup, um, and it's basically so you split the groups into two teams, and you'd have three or four fields depending on your numbers, and each field would have to have a one v one. Each another field would be a two v two, another field would be a three v three, and another field would be a four v four. 
and then you basically have to you calculate the scores up of all those and people would one team would get to choose who goes to which field first yeah. and then the other team then react to it so okay. if i see if, if i know i'm a decent player i might go play 1v1 because i feel i'm really good in 1v1s so the other team would then see who's gone to that field and be yeah. like okay who's who do we need to match up against that player and each field is worth a different level of points so we kind of get that competition element out of it as well and that that works really well the kids really enjoy that game as well and it's it's a good it's a good one now, uh, you talked about different formats of, of small-sided games. Um, did that, was that different for different age groups? So let, let's say, like, you know, U12, 13, 14. So that age group, which corresponds to kind of their middle school, was there a, 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 a sided, you know, a, a level that kind of worked really well? Was it four a side? Was it five a side? You know, what, are the, what, what did you zero in on as being kind of the best to kind of get um, the most kind of out of the training sessions? So to be honest, there isn't really a, to be honest, in my, in my view, the smaller the better, because then, excuse me, they're, they're, there's more opportunity for players to get more touch on the board, the smaller side it is. So for those age groups, so kind of 13 upwards, anything really depends, obviously, if you have goalies in. If you're not going to have goalies, then kind of 4v4, 5v5 is decent because it's from an intensity level, it's decent as long as the, fit, the field size is good. Um, it's, but again, there's no real definite format. If you go in straight into kind of 9v9 and 11v11, it's too much just because yeah. the kids want to do it. But you, there's yeah. obviously it's just you're not going to get the touch on the ball. So really, the smaller yeah. the better. And from an intensity standpoint, obviously with the 1v1 and 2v2, is that is very intense in terms yeah. of the level of compete and how long you're going to do it for. So you're looking at one to two minute maximums yeah. when you're doing 1v1, 2v2 games. So I wouldn't really say there's a, a nailed down for this is the way to go. Um, but anywhere kind of 4v4, 5v5 is, is good to get it because there's, there's so much tactical work within that framework as well. You sure. can do it from, um, from a, a game standpoint from there. So it's, I wouldn't say there's a definite four, like, format, but anywhere 4v4, 5v5, even 6v6, you can kind of manage it as well. And I guess last one for you. If we were to go back in time, um, now you've been at the return to play protocols and kind of working through the stages. If we were to go back to early July and, and we'd start this all over again, you know, what would you tell yourself? You know, what are the things you would say uh, you got to look out for? What are the things you would change uh, if you were to go through this again? Great question. Um, no, I'm not really sure, to be honest. There was, to be fair, Canada Soccer and Ontario Soccer have done a really good job in kind of make, putting all those details in. It seemed over the top at first, um, but with, when you think about it, with making sure the safety of the the safety of the participants is there. That's the most important thing. So really we what we did, we've actually phased everything in ourselves. So within each stage, so there was this within soccer there's three phases. <clears throat> so phase one was social distance, like no small so no games or anything like that. Phase two is into modified small sided games and phase three is kind of back to normal. Um, but I feel it feels the right way to do it to go with the social distance stuff. We we ended up staying in social distance practices a bit longer than we could have. So we, when we, we, we got the green light to go into stage two, um, we stayed in phase one just a little bit longer, just because it was only really, we were only in phase one for two weeks. Um, so we felt from a, a safety standpoint and a, an ease standpoint from, especially coming from the parents, they were a little bit like, well, are we go into this already. We're not necessarily yeah. comfortable. So we decided to kind of stay with it a little bit longer. We ended up doing two weeks, maybe probably only really needed one week extra. Because once you kind of get into four weeks of stage one socialist practices, it's kind of, it's, it is then the creative stuff really needs to come out. It gets yeah, hard yeah, to yeah. Um, do those sessions. So maybe if we've done one more week, but I think the socialist and practices was important to do um, just to kind of get the kids back going. And especially because we try to do online Zoom sessions as well with the kids. So yep. we gave them the option to do that. Um, so if they chose not to, they're coming back three months maybe without touching the ball. So yeah. do that and going straight into games would have been could have been caused a lot of issues in terms of injuries and all that stuff. So going into it, I think it was the right thing to do to to do the social distance practices um, and then build it up gradually. So I think really the most important thing is just making sure everybody's safe and yeah. and is comfortable doing it and going back. It wouldn't really that was really the only thing I would change is maybe like it's going back, not going for two weeks, just doing one week in. Um, when we could have moved to small side of games, but yeah. the social distance practices were were beneficial and kind of got people comfortable being back playing again. Well, thanks. I really appreciate it. I mean, it's nice to have uh, 
someone who's got this experience to go through um, what really is an unprecedented time for uh, not only youth sport, but, uh, you know, our society in general. And, and uh, you know, seeing the success that you guys have had and, and uh, it's going to be a, a huge resource for, for our coaches and hopefully, you know, uh, guides them into a smooth beginning of our uh, St. Andrews return to play. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me. I really appreciate it. And I wish all you guys all the best coming back into all the sports. Um, and I hope it all goes well. Thanks very much.